Hey, Cross of Life, Pastor Caleb here with another Lent devotion on Luke. We are going through the book of Luke during Lent, and if you're joining us, you should go along with the reading plan. That is in the description of the video on YouTube or in the episode notes on the podcast. I'm looking at verse 33 through 59 of chapter 12 today, so I'll give you a paraphrase of it and then a couple devotional thoughts. Uh, this section starts with Jesus completing what he would ta- has been talking about um, previous to this. He says, to sell your possessions and give to the poor. Um, he says, actually, this is uh, going to be a treasure in heaven that will never fail and where no thief can come and, uh, and steal or no moth can destroy. And then he has this really powerful phrase, which we'll zoom in on during the devotional time. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He then starts to talk about looking forward to the end of the world. He says, um, be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning. The idea there is that um, if you were waiting in the middle of the night, you needed a lamp and that lamp needed to have enough oil in order to burn because, um, well, maybe in a similar way that we have like batteries in our flashlights um, or batteries in our phone, we need to make sure that we have it charged so it can last when we do not have a charger near us. So he says, says, make sure you are ready, like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet. Um, It will be good for those servants if the master finds him watching. So, truly I tell you, he will dress himself to serve and have them recline at table and will come and wait on them. In other words, he says the master will bring the servants in after a party and sort of have an afterglow with them. (laughs) It's kind of an interesting thing. Um, Jesus here is is building this picture of what God is like, right? God is going to um, a wedding banquet. He is going to heaven, specifically Jesus himself. And he is going to come back and he is going to bring us, his servants, to be where he is with us. And if we are watchful, then we will be ready for the moment that he comes. Verse 39, he says, understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would have let his would not have let his house be broken into. You must also be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So the idea here, he's kind of switching the metaphor now. He's no longer talking about the master and servants. He's just talking about in, in general, a person who owns a house. If he knows that a thief is coming, he's not going to just sit back and let the thief come and take his stuff. He's going to prepare and he's going to make sure that that thief cannot take his stuff. In the same way, we ought to be watchful. We ought to be ready. We ought to have prepared for Jesus to come at any moment. Uh, Peter, at this point, verse 41, asks Jesus, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? Uh, But Jesus just keeps going, which is kind of interesting. He says, who then is the wise and faithful manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant when the master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. Um, on the other hand, though, he says, suppose the sermon, sermon, servant says to him, uh, it's been a long time, and he begins to beat the other servants, which I don't know why that's what you would do, but this is Jesus' story, not mine. Um, so uh, the master will come back, and that servant will um, have a, a bad outcome. He will cut him to pieces, is what Jesus says, and assign him a place with the unbelievers. Um, so the story here Jesus is just trying to tell us is that uh, if I put you in charge of feeding my people, not with food, but with the word of God. And you, those who are feeding, specifically Jesus is kind of answering Peter's question by saying, yeah, this is about you, Peter. You're going to be the one who preach preaches. And for us too, me specifically, I'm a pastor, I preach. But you also are a Christian who is in charge of making sure that you feed your family with God's word, who you feed um, others, other Christians in your church with God's word. He says, if you are not ready, if you are not preaching like tomorrow I'm coming back, then it's not going to be good for you either. (laughs) Uh, He he continues, verse 47, the servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready, does not know what the master wants, will be beaten with many blows. In other words, if you claim to be a preacher of the gospel, if you claim to be a Christian and you are not living like Jesus could come back, then it's not going to turn out well for you. He says, the one who knows, or excuse me, who does not know and does things deserving punishment will will be beaten with few blows. In other words, he says, if you're not a Christian, you will have it better on the last day than if you claim to be a Christian, but are not. That's crazy. Um, He finishes with this statement, for everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. For the one who has been entrusted with much, much will be asked. Uh, That's gonna be one of our devotional points and it's a huge one. Okay, not peace, but division is the next section. Uh, Jesus is talking about judgment on the earth. And the basic thrust of this section is talking about how, look, sin is so bad that I have to suffer for it. I have to, I have to under, undergo the judgment of all sin on the whole world in myself. Do you think that this is just a laughing matter? Like sin is a big deal. Um, so much so that it's going to divide people. 
Like we're not talking about unicorns and rainbows here or like, oh, you have your religion and I have mine. No, this is the difference between heaven and hell, eternity and suffering and eternity and bliss with God. And I'm willing to suffer for the sins of the world, but let's make no mistake. This isn't something that is, that is just to trifle with. This is something that deserves your entire life, so much so that you would be willing to divide against your own family because you believe this and they do not. That's a powerful idea. Well, again, that'll be one of our devotional points. Last thing that he talks about is interpreting the times. And this also has to do with the end of the world. But he basically says here that um, you look at the sky and you guys can read the weather, right? You guys can figure out, oh, spring is coming or summer's coming or a hot wind, hot wind is going to make a hot day or whatever the thing is. But you guys are not willing to look at the scriptures and see that I have made it very obvious when I'm going to come back. Now, not that he has given us the specific day. He himself says, no one knows the last day, not even the son. Only the father knows that. But you guys, I have given you the signs, I've given you the things to look for and they're all happening. In fact, they've all happened. I could come back anytime. And if you're not willing to watch the signs, you will be surprised and that will be bad for you. And so he says, figure it out, right? He gives this example. He says, if you're going with your adversary to the magistrate, so it's like, if you're going to court with somebody, try hard to be reconciled on the way or your adversary may drive, drag you off to the judge. The judge will turn you over to the officer and the officer will throw you into prison. And his point here is, look, if you're just waiting this out to see if you can figure it out, um, you are in trouble. You got to figure this out now because the judge is coming and you do not want to be um, unprepared when the judge comes back. Okay, let me give you a couple, <clears throat> excuse me, devotional points here. Um, the first of those is for where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Um, I, I think I always read this and thought about uh, this being like, um, my treasure reveals where my heart is. So like, um, you know, there are some things in my life that I, I can just spend money on without thinking about it, right? I just love those things so much. It's so easy for me to spend money on those things. Um, and maybe that's true for you. You know, some things in your life, you're just like, I don't even care what it costs. I don't care what my budget says. Like, I just want that thing. Um, and that is true. Like your money does reveal where your heart is at. But I think Jesus has a kind of a double entendre here. He's also saying that your treasure can lead your heart. So in a sense, what he's saying is if you want to love something more, invest money in it. Like as a Christian, that should lead us to think, okay, then I ought to invest my money in the work of Jesus because I want to love Jesus more. Uh, give me give you an example. You may not care about sports, but if you were forced to put a $500 bet on a sporting event, would you watch the game? <laughs> would you care about the result? Your heart would be in it because your treasure was. In the same way, if you want to be invested in Jesus and his work, put your treasure there. Put your treasure into his work. Now, I think immediately people think of offerings to your church, and that's absolutely part of it. I mean, God's principle is 10% of your income goes to the work of the church. But you're called to do more than that. To be generous to the poor. That's exactly what he says in the verse before this, right? Sell your possessions. Give to the poor. Not just, what's my income? I'm going to give some of my income. No, like, I'm going to get rid of my tangible assets in order to gain money so that I can give it away. Whoa. Because if you're willing to do that, your heart will be in the work of Jesus which is to love the poor. Second devotional point um, is uh, at the, uh, <clears throat> in this section where he's talking about the masters and the servants. And uh, the idea here is that like, if you are a believer and you give up the faith or you are not watchful, it is going to be worse for you than for the person who never knew. And that again is crazy to us. Um, we just finished talking about this last time about how um, investing in heaven like there is a certain level of like levels of heaven idea sort of that has to do with our work here on earth. There's also sort of a levels of hell idea. Again, these things are not super clear to us in the scriptures, but they are definitely hinted at. In, in, uh, and I think we ought to understand them that like, if you are given God's word, that is not something to be, um, to be trifled with. That is not something that you are going to just consider a hobby or like an accessory to your life or just something that you do. Like you have been given the entire, the, eternal word of God. You have been given the pearl of great price. You have been given the crown jewel of life itself, that God would talk to you when you were by nature an enemy of him. And if you've been given that and you treat it like it's something nice to have around, but not the very thing in which you built your life, you're worse than the person who never heard it in the first place. Because you knew what you had and you rejected it. 
Now, I'm sure that raises some other questions, and that's the kind of stuff we should pray and meditate on. And maybe you can ask a question in the question form. <laughs> but it should challenge every one of us who call ourselves Christians. Do we love the scriptures like that? Do we realize the power of knowing the eternal word of God? And not that we fear judgment, but that we should be called to action. That the word of God is not just something to fit in my schedule. It is the thing that determines my schedule. My schedule is built around when do I get to hear from God? And it starts a Sunday morning. It continues with Bible study during the week. It continues with devotional life at home, whether that was with your family or by yourself. Build your life on the thing that actually matters because God has given you a great gift in his word and you ought not throw it away. Um, all right. And then the last devotional point here is division, not peace. Um, it's really a powerful thing when Jesus says in verse 51, do you think I came to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you, a division. Um, Jesus is not here to unite everyone. Now he will unite all believers in Christ, even though they are sinful, even though they maybe struggle with understanding Jesus, but they repent and they hold on to Jesus for salvation. He will unite those people, but he's not here to save everybody. Because there are people who are going to reject him. There are people who are not going to believe in him. And if we are not willing to hold on to Jesus, even in the face of losing the people who might be closest to us, like a mother or a daughter or a son or a father, then we don't understand how serious this is. Jesus says, this is life and death. You know, think about it in this way. Um, if you're walking, this is so super weird hypothetical situation, but this is what came to my mind. <laughs> you're... You're walking up to two doors and, uh, and you know that behind one of those doors is certain death and behind the other door is certain life. And you're pick the person you love the most in the world, your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter. They say, I want to go through this door. They don't maybe know, maybe they do. They want to go through this door that behind it is certain death. And they start walking towards the door. What are you going to do? You going to walk with them into certain death? Or are you going to say, as hard as this is, I can't walk through you with you through that door because that's death. That's what Jesus is asking us to think about. I cannot love my family, or love my spouse, love my kids, love my best friend more than Jesus. And it means that I can't have the same type of relationship with people who are not believers in Jesus. I mean, I think scripture is pretty clear on this. You should not get married to somebody who is not a Christian. In fact, I would go as far as to say you should not get married to somebody who do not, does not believe everything you believe about the scriptures the same as you do. Because you are yoking yourself to somebody and they are not the same as you. And there is going to be a point when they believe something that leads to death. And you're going to have to choose whether you're going to unite with them in that belief that leads to death or whether you're going to choose life and you're going to have to divide. And that doesn't mean necessarily you're going to get divorced or anything like that, but man, living in a world where you don't believe the same things about the most fundamental realities of life with your spouse, I don't think you want to live there. The point is for us to understand the importance of Jesus' work. And Jesus gives us that, right? He says, I'm going to suffer God's wrath for sin so that you don't have to. Now don't choose to go back into that wrath because of some human relationship. This is life or death, eternal life or death. Follow me, follow my word and watch. Keep your eyes open to what is going on around you. Don't just listen to whatever the person on the TV or the person on your phone says. They're of the world. They don't love you. They don't care if you know the truth. They're trying to make money. Now that might mean they tell you the truth sometimes, but why would you trust them to always tell you the truth if they're not doing it because they love God? Look at the world around you and run it through the lens of God's word because this is more important than what's happening in your nation or your neighborhood. It's about your eternal life. Let's not forget that. Thanks for taking time for this devotion. I look forward to catching you next time.